Arxan is now digital.ai. Join us at our booth in the virtual expo hall to learn how our app protection, white box cryptography, and threat analytics solutions can help you stay ahead of the evolving threat landscape. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ido Safrudi, uh, co-founder and CTO at Perimeter X. And with me is a uh, uh, security evangelist with, with us. Uh, and we're going to talk today about MageCard in 2020, uh, and which is, as we call it here, the new face of XSS or cross-site scripting and the new vulnerabilities and, and attack vector there. Perimeter X is a web application security company and uh, we're doing a lot of research around all kinds of uh, application abuse and, and MageCard is a major uh, phenomena that we're researching uh, to protect our customer. And, and to start with, what is MageCard? Uh, obviously, I, I assume everyone here on this audience heard it at, to one extent, uh, to a certain extent. And uh, MageCard in general is a aggregated term for a type of uh, attack uh, that is a, a group of different threats uh, operated by multiple organizations uh, that are typically targeting uh, client-side application, uh, client-side browser uh, for to practice digital skimming or also known as form jacking. Uh, and and think, think about it as uh, getting some code into the application that runs on the browser side that helps them acquire and collect information about the visitors. Uh, the type of information that they typically care about is that all kind of personal data, things that are valuable for them. Uh, the most common use case is any payment information, uh, most commonly credit card information or other payment related information that they can then collect and leverage in other places. Uh, and we've seen victims of that uh, in the last couple of years uh, across multiple retail, travel and other brands, including even uh, foundations and, and, and nonprofits uh, like cancer foundations and other uh, benefits in recently uh, for Corona aid and things like this, where so wherever a site has a, a form that can collect information, uh, it obviously becomes a target for these kind of skimmers. Uh, some famous uh, attacks uh, were recently on Macy's, uh, British Airways got a very um, uh, hyped uh, attack and got a lot of PR around it because of the hefty fine that GDPR uh, taxed them for, for losing personal information. Uh, so it's not only breaching potential data and, and causing actual damage, uh, there is an additional fine that can be on top of that. Uh, MageCard also just going to the origin of the name uh, is uh, originally starting from Magento. Uh, so Magento is a very common platform. And when you go back to the original uh, attacks that were dubbed MageCard, it, it initially was a combination of the word uh, Magento and shopping cart because this is the where the initial attack started. We're trying to target the shopping cart activity on Magento stores, uh, an extremely popular uh, platform uh, for, for retail. Uh, but obviously, most of the recent MageCard attacks are not only focused on Magento or Magento-like platforms, but are targeting any website. And why is this seeing such a huge rise in the last few years? Um, what we're seeing is uh, attackers are targeting that because the, the way web is built, the web of the applications are built, the way businesses are operating, evolved dramatically in the last few years. Uh, so we're seeing uh, 10x more website than a decade ago. Uh, obviously, everyone here knows that the web is growing. Uh, more and more businesses is, is, is going through digital transformation. Much more developers are, are, are building and, and building code there, which is op opening more exposure. And more and more code is being transferred 
to the front end from the back end. So a lot of the logic we, from, from thin application and heavy on the back end, and more and more applications are moving to fast clients, uh, being it mobile or uh, single application or dynamic code where uh, most of the logic is running as a code on the client side, rendering and collecting information via APIs. And when looking at all this transition and, and increase of, of code on the front end, uh, it's, it's also obvious to see that uh, more than 70% of the website front end code is not actually code that was generated by the developers themselves, but a lot of it is third party open source libraries, uh, partners, uh, third party vendors that are providing services. Think of uh, Google Analytics, for instance, ads, uh, checkout, uh, customer support, a lot of modules that you include by embedding some third party code there. And all this change is presenting, obviously, for attacker, uh, an interesting uh, vertical to, to target. Um, and that present, this, this entire shift is also presenting what we call as a client-side shadow code. And what is this client-side shadow code that, that we're saying? Basically, part of the challenges when, when you're looking at so much code that is running on the front end is that JavaScript code is statically added. You include some, some snippet of, uh, of code on the H main HTML page that you embed it once, but then you are dynamically loading the JavaScript and in the browser and the JavaScript, the JavaScript itself may change when you are including a, a tag for, uh, for Google Analytics, for instance, as the example before, you include it once, as Google, as Google are rolling out new versions for Google Analytics, you don't need to change your site. The, the updated script is automatically being loaded there. Um, another, another aspect is that because all this logic is happening on the browser and all this code is running and rendered and the elements that it brings and fetches are running on the browser side, the website owners, if you're uh, owning a website uh, that is having a lot of capabilities or JavaScript capability, you have no visibility on what actually is happening on the client side. So if a new script is now being modified or if a vent third party vendor was breached and is loading a different script or a vulnerable script, you on your data center and all your security tools that you have on your own data center, you, you are completely blind to that because all that is being rendered and, and achieved on the client side. And, and, and obviously these two, two things are, are a, a very uh, good foundation and very attractive uh, assets for attackers to go after. Uh, this is where they, they can be in the shadows and, and act and operate for a long period of time. Uh, and in a potentially much easier way than actually tapping into your highly secured data center, uh, if they can collect information from the users versus from your database, why should they hack into the database versus doing that? And this is the trend and the shift and the opportunity that all these shifts in the last days is presenting. And to learn more about how they're doing that, I'll hand it over to Amit to to walk through some of the recent attacks, some of the analysis that we're doing and some of the potential risks to be aware of. Thank you, Ido. So we looked at, we looked at what is the mage card problem and why it, it affects uh, modern web applications. Uh, for the rest of the, st of the stock, we wanna take a look at how do these attacks actually enter a typical website and what are the different injection techniques? Uh, what makes it really hard and complex to detect? We'll look at a case study and a, uh, for a example, a couple examples of actual attacks that our research team has uncovered in the wild and then wrap it up with some best practices recommendations on how, how website owners can, can mitigate and prevent uh, these types of attacks. So if you look at injection techniques, uh, there are a few different ways that uh, now, mesh card attacks can infect a website. And the first, uh, of course, common approach is a traditional 
compromise of the first party infrastructure, right? So this could be, you know, through a account, uh, you know, brute force attack on the uh, the infrastructure somewhere on the develop uh, uh, the development cycle that can insert a snippet or change a, a snippet or change a uh, a script uh, directive to load potentially uh, unknown code or shadow code onto the web application itself. And this is this, and the other. You know, this can also be done by taking over uh, by carrying out cross-site scripting attacks against the infrastructure and getting access to the backend database and credentials and so on. But another more common approach we are seeing more and more right now is the use of cloud storage. Uh, S3 buckets, uh, you know, get uh, get the brunt of this, but this this has also been found on other cloud providers' uh, storage services. And what we're finding is that security controls and permissions on, on S3 buckets are often not up to par. And they are, you know, hackers are constantly scanning S3 buckets on the internet to find ones where they have right access. And when they do find one that where they have right with, with weak permissions, where they have right access that's potentially hosting web JavaScript for web. Uh, they can go in and modify it and insert malicious code in the JavaScript. And then, you know, when that script phones home to a command and control server, uh, they know they know what targets they've acquired that way. All right. So this is a, a common first party attack technique that we're seeing on web applications. But the other way to insert malicious code into web apps is open source libraries. So as you know, you know most uh, modern development makes extensive use of open source libraries, uh, both for uh, and for, for in-house applications as well as uh, you know, customer-facing web applications. And this, you know, this enables a level of uh, innovation and a pace of innovation that is really, uh, really beneficial to the industry as a whole. But th this comes with a few problems. Uh, with open source libraries that are in repositories online, you often don't know who all have commit access, right? So it's by definition, they're community projects and you have large numbers of people that have access to make changes to these libraries, uh, which is a, a good thing because you know bugs get resolved really quickly, but uh, the downside of that is you don't know what vulnerabilities may get introduced. Uh, there may be uh, insider threats, there may be, uh, you know, there's more weight, there's, the attack surface is a lot larger. And another problem with open source libraries is, of course, uh, you know, zero day vulnerabilities that may exist in the code that uh, that somebody can discover and exploit. And that's another way that uh, malicious code can enter a web application. And then, of course, there are always account takeover attempts of people who have uh, commit access or uh, have permissions to change things in the open source library. And, and that's, that's also abused extensively to uh, carry these out. And then, a third attack, the injection technique is uh, third-party attacks on third-party script providers. So this is, you know, like you don't mentioned about finding about seventy percent of code on a typical web application is uh, third-party, and this actually represents a really large attack surface for uh, for for many third-party attacks. And again, like with uh, with first party, you know, this is it's going to use similar techniques like cross-site scripting or you know, looking for exposed S3 buckets, or another common approach is uh, plugins that are used in common content management systems. Uh, WordPress is notorious for this. Uh, there's almost a vulnerability announced you know, every month and, and something discovered in a plugin. And version control and version management is generally generally not well regulated with these plugins. So uh, this becomes a, a weak point for many many web applications and uh, e-commerce sites and uh, and and you know, customer facing sites. And now this represents a really large attack surface, and this is also an attractive target for attackers because by taking over one service that is used by you know, thousands of different sites, they can actually get a much uh, much bigger yield. Uh, and, and a great example of this is, you know, a couple of months ago, a, a leading communications provider you know, published a uh, published a vulnerability that their uh, one of their most commonly used scripts uh, was actually on an S3 bucket with uh, wrong permissions, and a known MageGuard gang was able to um, to modify it, and this malicious code actually made its way into you know, thousands of different websites. Uh, thankfully, it was discovered and uh, fixed before before it caused uh, any known harm. 
But this is a great example of how by attacking a single service, a mesh guard attacker can get access to you know, thousands and thousands of websites and, uh, and millions of user records. So the one thing we see with uh, mage card attacks is they tend to they tend to last for a really long time. They evade detection, and they uh, you know typically when the vulnerability is discovered and and you do the security analysis, you find out that it's been running for several months or several weeks, and it has escaped detection for a long time. And part of the part of the reason is like you don't mention that this code is running on the client side, where the website owner is typically not that don't have full visibility into what's going on there. And it's also very dynamic. So what actually loads when a user loads a website, uh, what loads on the browser, what loads on my browser may be very different than what loads on Edo's browser or your browser uh, based on certain conditions and criteria and uh, you know where we are, what types of uh, devices we're using. And, and certain other logic that's present present in these apps. So it becomes, it's a challenging problem to detect and a fairly complex threat. And to make things worse, we're dealing with a few other sort of uh, layers of uh, obscurity. Like uh, for example, a lot of MageCard is, is obfuscated code. It's obfuscated JavaScript. So a visual inspection will not reveal what it's doing. And obfuscating JavaScript for you know, web applications is, is, is not just, uh, you know, it's used uh, legitimately as well as a way of preserving integrity and hiding intellectual property. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but that just creates, a, it creates room for, for malware to lurk as well. Uh, and it's not straightforward to, uh, to determine what this code is doing just by looking at the source. The other common attack technique we see is through lookalike malicious domains. So we might, we've seen a, a lot of incidents where a commonly used service, so let's say Google Analytics as an example, a hacker might register a lookalike domain and they'll change one character, for example. So they've changed the I here to the I with the, with the character, with an accent. And uh, you know, this is an entirely different name by, you know, by, if you look at the Unicode, this is a different name. And you know, the way DNS rules work right now, you know, for better or for worse, uh, you know, identities can be hidden. So it's really hard to go verify who actually owns this and whether that the owner is up to no good. And uh, by doing this, what hackers can do is they can modify you know, commonly used uh, scripts in, in a page like, uh, like Google Analytics, right? Which is used uh, to gather stats on, on most websites and they can change this and they can actually load a malicious version of Google Analytics from a domain that they control. And that malicious script can then load other malicious scripts as well and, uh, and you know, start scraping or start uh, uh, taking over content from the, uh, from the website. The other thing we see a lot of is uh, tripwires and evasion mechanisms, uh, which are used to, you know, to, to evade analysts. So we've seen cases where the malicious code, that, where, they, where the code that's been in, in, injected it actually has logic that says, you know, what's the browser window size? Uh, is the window size such that DevTools might be open? And if it suspects that DevTools is open on Chrome, then it will not load the malicious piece. It'll load a clean version of the script and everything looks normal. But if it, uh, or if it's coming from like an AWS source IP address, it will not load the malicious script, which could indicate, you know, a scanner, or it could indicate uh, you know, some attempt to, to analyze the, the, the page. Uh, we've seen really innovative exfiltration techniques as well. The most common ones are an XHR post, but we've seen also the use of steganography, which is hiding data in, in image requests or, or, or hiding malicious code in images. And uh, you know, these are some of the ways the exfiltration of the data actually can be masked as well. So you know, it's, a, it's a fairly complex threat even for advanced security analysts to, to detect and analyze. So having said that, let's take a look at one example, a couple examples. So this first one here is a, a fashion retailer out of France that was compromised. This is from about uh, a little under a year ago. And what we found here is really interesting. So there, the way the, the malicious skimmer script was loaded was through many levels of indirection. So it's a multi-stage multi attack. And in the first stage, what we found was, of course, the websites, uh, the, uh, the attackers gain access to the website 
and they were able to uh, you know get to get to a point where they can insert uh, or modify the uh, the source code. And what they did is they placed a uh, a malicious loader that looked on the surface like Google Analytics, right? So it looked like uh, Google Analytics Tag Manager, and it actually was inserted inline into the uh, into the source code, but it actually loaded uh, the script from a from a malicious from a uh, domain that was controlled by the hackers. And this Tag Manager loaded a another script, and the uh, the the domain name for the script was actually encoded in this uh, string that you see here. So by visual inspection, you couldn't tell that they were loading something from a, uh, from a malicious domain. Uh, you'd have to you know, uh, reverse the hash here and, and update this URL, which, uh, which is where the malicious script was uh, loaded from. But this was not actually the skimmer. So this script then in turn loaded yet another script, which was the actual skimmer. And this was also loaded from the same domain. And this is a script that uh, started sniffing credit card information and other personal data on the checkout page for this website and transmitting it back to the command and control server, which was uh, magento.info. And again, this was a uh, domain registered by the hackers for the purpose of carrying out this attack. And, but if you look just visual inspection of the source code, this domain doesn't, doesn't show up anywhere. So it's really hard to just uh, catch these types of attacks by, by source code inspection through cursory scanning or through kind of advanced analysis, right? You have to kind of reverse engineer the uh, the multiple layers of scripts to figure out uh, what they're doing, and what the negative impact of the of these scripts might be. And, and this is why why this problem is really hard to detect and solve because unless you have uh, you know kind of some runtime uh, signals that tell you what uh, the page is actually doing, it's just hard to hard to detect and stop this kind of kind of attack. I want to talk a little bit about the inter skimmer. So this has been talked about quite a bit, and this is a skimming toolkit that has been uh, sold and used on the wild for over twelve months now. And this toolkit actually is is uh, is a way to give you know, take the complexity out of mage card attacks, and it makes mage card attacks accessible to even uh, novice hackers uh, that don't need to know the you know, the the nuances and the and the details. It's very, very customizable. And you can choose what you want to do with it. You can choose from different exfiltration techniques uh, using the skimmer. And one of the most common uses of the skimmer we find is, to, is creating fake checkout forms. So what hackers are ultimately after stealing, you know, try after payment card information. And uh, many checkout forms will use uh, iframes to, to kind of mask that information from other scripts on the page. And so to get around that problem, what we see hackers doing is they'll modify a page before that. So like the product browsing page or the shopping cart page. And uh, by modifying the DOM, uh, the document object model, they can insert a button that looks like a checkout button. The user doesn't know. The user clicks on it. And they actually get uh, taken to a fake checkout page, which is actually controlled by the hacker. And this checkout page will inherit all the style, uh, the CSS, the style sheets, from the main page. So it has similar look and feel, similar font, similar structure. But now this is this page is entirely controlled by controlled by the hackers. And you now when you type in your, your personal information, your credit card information, uh, and, and head submit, nothing happens. Nothing happens because all this page is able to do is actually post that information to the command and control server. And from there, you know, that information is harvested and then sold on the dark web. But the user experience is a little bit uh, a little bit marred because the, and the first time it fails, and then you know they might go back and they might try you know to check out again and this time they'll get the correct form and they'll be they'll be able to complete the transaction. But there's there's still you know this still provides a little bit of a clue to the user if they're informed, if they're educated, they can sense that maybe something was wrong, they can you know open a ticket with the vendor and say, hey, I suspected something. There might have been a, a skimmer on this page I, and had this strange experience. And that can alert the website owners to the existence of this uh, toolkit, and they can take uh, steps to stop it. So uh, so we've seen a lot of interest. So it has, we've seen still you know, a lot of successful uh, hacks using the inter-skimmer. 
and using these fake checkout forms. And uh, you know, this continues to be a really popular toolkit. Uh, recently, we've even seen Enter being offered as a service where you know the uh, the hack the 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 writers of this toolkit will do all the hard work for you, and they'll just do a revenue share, and uh, you get a portion of the of the proceeds from from you know selling the credit card numbers. They keep a portion, and they just make it really easy and accessible. So it's kind of a bit of a democratization of uh, MH card skimming toolkits. But we still have this problem that they are not able, there is a, a clue to the, uh, the user that something wrong happened. And this is the, the problem that uh, mage card attackers have been trying to solve. And here's an example of, of how you know, they solved it without having to go through the fake checkout path. So the ultimate holy grail for mage card attackers is the payment script. And they've been, looking for ways to actually compromise payment scripts uh, so that they don't have to you know, do the fake checkout, they don't have to alter the, the user path, but they can get a copy of the credit card data while the user is successfully uh, carrying out a transaction. And here's an example of an attack that our, the Perimeter X research team discovered uh, that was effect that was on Braintree, which is the PayPal payment service that's used as a payment gateway for many e-commerce sites. And very often, you know, uh, E-commerce retailers will use a you know a PCI compliant uh, payment provider like Braintree, and uh, and a good day you know all this data is, is partitioned within an iframe. The the retailer doesn't have access to it, so they're able to comply with PCI regulations and attestations that uh, you know they're they're not storing the credit card information anywhere on this site. It's all handled by Braintree, and they're uh, you know, they're able to kind of offload a bit of that responsibility. But the key takeaway here is that that doesn't necessarily guarantee data privacy. So here's an example where hackers were actually able to, you know, first they gain access to the site and they modified the source for the page. And instead of calling you know, the usual URL braintreegateway.com and loading the script from there, they loaded the script from a, a fake domain that they controlled called braintreegateway24.com. And what's interesting is that they were able to bypass all of the validation and all the client-side validation. And using this uh, altered version of the script, they're actually able to run successful payment transactions. And this is really interesting because they, you, know, you have a situation where you have modified client-side script and Braintree is accepting requests from that and, and concluding successful transactions. But this modified script also sends a copy off the credit card to uh, the command and control server hosted by the by the hackers, and this is it's a problem because you know, users have no indication that anything wrong happened. This doesn't uh, show up anywhere on the on the server logs. So the website owner has no indication that this happened, and Braintree has no indication that this happened because they're they're receiving you know transaction requests like they normally would from their own script, and there there's no you know. Without looking at the the endpoint, the, the the client side behavior, it's really hard to detect something like this, that uh, and uh, and stop it, because this is all running within an iframe. It's following all the security best practices. It's meeting PCI compliance objectives, but you know, your data is getting skimmed at the same time. So this was another interesting attack that uh, that mesh guard attackers are are after, and they're replicating this across other payment services as well. And there's a detailed analysis of this incident on the Perimeter X blog, which you can uh, you can take a look at, and uh, it just walks through all the different steps in this uh, in this attack and, and how it transpired. So we looked at you know the client side blind side problem. We looked at kind of how shadow code gets into the website. Uh, some examples of how mage card attacks uh, affect web web applications. What can we do to actually prevent this? Um, so there, there are a few sort of best practices you can follow to control this problem. So first of all, you know, protecting your web infrastructure is just sort of a baseline for, for any web application security uh, posture. So make sure you're using web application firewalls to protect against more of the traditional cross-site scripting attacks. Make sure you're using strong admin passwords and multi-factor authentication to make sure that even if an admin account gets compromised, uh, you know, the MFA will prevent uh, prevent uh, hackers from getting in. 
make sure all your, you know, if you're using a CMS, third-party CMS or third-party platform, make sure all your plugins are properly vetted and uh, make sure you apply all of the security patches on time. This is just basic security hygiene that you can use to protect uh, your infrastructure. And in addition, you know, secure your development processes for first-party scripts. So make sure you're doing security audits early on, uh, analyzing open source libraries for vulnerabilities early in the cycle. So you know, whatever gets out into, into the staging and production environment is clean. I uh, can at least control that. You can, but like Ido mentioned in the beginning, this only protects you know a small portion of the scripts that you have that you have out there. You have about seventy percent uh, third-party scripts. How do you protect against those and potential attacks on the third-party scripts? So there are some techniques you can use, like uh, content security policies. So CSP is a really uh, useful uh, solution to this problem because uh, CSP lets you enforce policies on the browser. So if you're familiar with CSP, it's a set of directives that uh, the site can send down to the browser that then restrict you know, where, what domains it can load scripts from. Uh, it restricts what domains the, uh, the site can communicate with and, uh, and you know, what, uh, in, you know, what code it can run and, and where, you know, where it can, uh, can write to. So CSP rules are really useful and, uh, but they're not entirely sufficient uh, but for a couple of reasons. So, you know, CSPs are, are hard to manage because they are, uh, you know, they have to be maintained, right? So now, if you're deploying a site, you need to know in advance you know, what all the different domains are that all of your third parties are communicating with. Uh, you need to have a change management process in place so that uh, when the domains change, they can, uh, uh, you know, the, the policy can be modified. And if you don't do that, if you don't do that regularly, then you end up with uh, broken site functionality and uh, a poor user experience, which is, uh, which is sort of difficult to, to palette uh, for most organizations. So. This becomes a there's, a, there's definitely a maintenance issue for CSP. And then the other thing to keep in mind is CSP is not gonna protect you against uh, first party compromises. So if there is a, a known set of hosts that are allowed under the CSP rules, uh, those are yours, could be a, a vendor that you really trust and you have a, a, a tight relationship with. And if those are allowed, then, then the hackers are just going to seek to compromise those hosts in order to insert uh, malware into, into your website. And then, so CSPs are useful, but uh, along with that, I think what's really useful is uh, visibility into, from the client side as to what the, what the scripts are actually doing. So there's solutions available, uh, that, like from Perimeter X, uh, that help you monitor the client side of, uh, of your application and collect signals from your users' browsers in real time. And, uh, and these solutions can baseline the behavior or what normal looks like. Uh, they can flag any anomalies. So if a script that uh, third-party script suddenly starts communicating with a known malicious domain, that's anomalous behavior that can be flagged, that can be uh, that you can raise alarm on. And then you can actually use uh, content security policies to uh, to stop that communication, to mitigate that behavior without crippling the site functionality, without damaging the, the good actions that, uh, that your scripts are doing as well. So, you know, MageCard attacks have grown in size and scope, but uh, it's definitely uh, the solutions to, to solve and address them are, 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 are here as well. Uh, it's a difficult problem because, you know, of the traditional client side, blind side, but uh, by having set, you know, visibility into what, uh, what's going on in the client side can really get this problem under control. And with that, thank you for, uh, for joining us here at uh, the Global AppSec. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us and, uh, and happy to, uh, to discuss further.